Well, welcome to our Easter celebration and welcome to one of the weirdest ones in my life. Um, you know, usually there's so many things of getting together and having all these services and inviting your friends and, and people just having this sense of celebration and then often big family meals afterwards. And, and we're doing none of that. Um, we're coming from a video to you and your watch party or in your home or wherever you are in the, in the world. And we are coming yet still to celebrate the same thing, which is the life, the death and life of Jesus and how it means a difference to us. And so I'm going to start with going way back to something that Christians have done since the very first celebration. And that is when one party would see each other on Easter, they would say, he is risen. And I know most of you know the answer to this because we've been doing this for quite a while, but I'm going to say he is risen. And wherever you are in your living room, if you're all by yourself or with your family, I want you to say, he is risen indeed, and say it good and loud, would you? All right, let's try this. He's risen. He is risen indeed. Uh, little weak. I know you're a little shy. You haven't known your parents that long. Um, let, let's try this once more, okay? In fact, I have another suggestion. Not only let's say it out loud, but if you're watching on Facebook, why don't you type, he is risen indeed, because the more people that comment, the wider this will be spread. Let's try it once more. He is risen. <laughs> That's awesome. And we are here talking about the resurrected life. In fact, I want you to not only go back and celebrate and think through and remember that with me, I want you to directly tie how the death and the resurrection of Jesus, how does that relate to your life? And what is the difference does it make? And if it doesn't already make a difference, how can it? Because the end of the story is always what's the most important part of the story. No matter what's happened in the ups and downs of somebody's life, how they come to the end of their life makes a huge difference. And so we're gonna go back and we are gonna celebrate not only the resurrection of Jesus, but we are celebrating the crucifixion of Jesus. And I know to some who, who maybe not understand fully the story or may not even be believers, the idea that you, would, that you would have a symbol of death and torture and, and the blood that's talked about and the, the beating of Jesus and the suffering, it just, it just seems wrong and odd to some people because why would you celebrate a torture instrument? Why would you celebrate something that was so awful? And we are coming through this story to tell you about the good news. That's what the Bible talks about the, the news of how Jesus can change our life. It's called the good news. But the good news becomes great news if you really understand the bad news. That the resurrection of Jesus is so incredible against the backdrop of the purpose of the crucifixion and even the, the suffering of the crucifixion. And there are some people that say they're Christians, but they have no cross. They don't want to emphasize the cross. That's too... That's, that's too ugly. And we want to say that this is a critically important part of how Jesus makes a difference in our life. And, and some Christian traditions have Jesus hanging on the cross, which, which I think is a mistake because that's memorializing one half the story. But the important part of the story is that the cross is empty. And even though it was an instrument of torture, it is empty because the cross has done its work. And I, and I think we have a wonderful illustration, not only right here in front of me, but we have an illustration that Jesus actually uses. And, and I have in my hand here a bulb. And uh, it's a big, beautiful bulb that has been living in a plastic sack for the last year and a half. And uh, I never got around to planting it. It just is staying there. And it is therefore trying to send out little shoots, but nothing will ever come of it. And Jesus uses that illustration and he talks about himself and he uses the picture only, he, he says he's a grain of wheat. And he says, unless the grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it grows into the ground and dies, then it produces life. It produces a multitude of wheat. And and a, a bulb is the same way. If, if you and I could pretend that this bulb has feelings and choices and they say, you know, I want to be up where there's beauty and light and air and I want to experience life. Don't stick me in the ground. Don't kill me. Don't end my life. And that is in essence the same exact choice that Jesus made is he intentionally 
went to the cross and allowed himself to be put into the ground. And it's interesting, even the way that a bulb is made is that when you put it into the ground, the, the outside, the main part of it, which they call the scales, it actually rots and becomes the nutrients by which the little core of life inside then blossoms into a beautiful flower. And so in some ways, that's a wonderful picture. And in Mark chapter 16, and we've been walking through the book of Mark, and if you haven't been a part of our study for the last nine weeks, uh, we invite you to go onto our website and look back under sermons. And, and we walk through so many wonderful stories about not only Jesus, but about the people who were around him and who watched him and whose lives ultimately were changed by him. And so at the end of chapter 15, it talks about Jesus after hours of fake kangaroo court trials and of being beaten so that he was almost killed by the beating and then finally on a cross for hours. And it says, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And then the temple, a cert, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was a son of God. And you remember Mark is a, is a gospel of action and he, he talks to the, what is the details that have happened, the bare, the core of the story. And here he ends the life of Jesus with this Roman centurion standing there and looking at, at the man that he's crucified and saying, wow, this, this man was the son of God. There was, something, there was something different about him. And then they took him and they buried him in a tomb right nearby. And then the next part, chapter 16, starts what we are celebrating this Easter. And it says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, very specific people. In fact, those were people who were standing there at the foot of the cross as they watched Jesus die. They watched him being taken off. But because it was their Jewish Sabbath, they couldn't do anything about preparing the body for burial. So they were coming two days later to prepare Jesus' body for the final resting place. They had no expectation of anything except finding a body. And it says, so they might go to anoint the body of Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday morning, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Because when they, looked, when they had seen there, and the tomb was uh, covered by a huge stone, it says, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, which the other gospels tell us is an angel, actually. And he's sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. Up to this moment, there's no good news in this story. You see, you and I often read in the end of the story before we get there. They came expecting to put spices and to wrap Jesus' body and to prepare it in the Jewish manner for being left on this, this stone table within a, a cave. And that was going to be the end. And they came and then there's this young man and he's saying, he's not here. Well, that's even worse. Now we can't even find his body. We can't even have that last bit of closure. We can't even memorialize that. And so I, I want to start us there with what's the purpose of the death of Jesus? What does that do? What is that, how does that make a difference in my life? And I think the death of Jesus and the crucifixion and all the stories around it can illustrate to you and I how desperately we need to understand why Jesus died and what the cross means. And in fact, how that emphasizes to me how much I need Jesus. So let's look at the, the people who are around the cross. And first of all, there were the Jewish leaders and they were very well versed in the Old Testament prophecies and the Old Testament scriptures, but they had sold out to wealth and power and they chose their own kingdom instead of God's kingdom. And so they, they set up a totally fake system by which they tried to actually get people to lie at Jesus' trial so that they could crucify him, so they could, they could find some reason to get rid of him. And here is the, the height of hypocrisy because at the same time, they were trying to celebrate the, the Christian, pass, or excuse me, the Jewish Passover. And the Jewish Passover, which is a wonderful, beautiful picture that the Jewish people have celebrated up to this present day about how God had delivered them out of the slavery of Egypt and, and how they had been in bondage and how 
uh, Moses had come down and God had done a great work to, to bring them out of slavery. And while they are trying to remain clean for the Jewish Passover, they were at the same time standing and accusing Jesus. The, the Bible calls him the, the, the Passover lamb, the one who was to be sacrificed on this day when they had celebrated the freedom from death and the freedom from slavery. And Jesus intentionally allowed his death to be right there in the middle of that. And they were trying to be very religious and at the same time kill the son of God. So the end of their story, sadly enough, is they crucified Jesus. They tried to retain power. And about 35 years later, a Jewish rebellion was, was, was uh, fomented in their country and and eventually the Romans came in and not only destroyed their army, but destroyed the temple, destroyed the center of their place of worship. And their story did not end well. You see, what's important about a story is how it ends. And then we look around the, the rest of the people involved in the scenario, and, and I think of Judas. And Judas was the one who had walked with Jesus and talked with him and seen his miracles. He, he was a part of that group of 12 that were around Jesus for the whole three years he was in public ministry. And I don't know what his motives were, and I don't know how he rationalized this, but somewhere he thought Jesus was getting out of bounds, and, and he, in an incredibly sad moment, decided that he would go to the Jewish authorities and he would tell them how to find Jesus when he was not surrounded by crowds. And, and for 30 pieces of silver, he agreed to betray Jesus. And, you know, we can... We can be against an enemy, but you can only be betrayed by a friend. And Judas was part of that inner circle. And he went and he sold him. And then in, in the garden, or excuse me, went after the Garden of Gethsemane, when they were, they were there on the Mount of Olives, Judas actually led the, the army, led the, the group of soldiers, and he, and he gave Jesus a kiss. And he betrayed him with a kiss. And what happened to the end of his life? Well, you know, he... He realized at some point what he had done was so wrong and he, he came back and took those 30 pieces of silver back to the very place where he had gotten them and he said, I can't, I can't do this. I, I have betrayed innocent blood. And, and they in their self-righteousness said, well, we can't take it back. It's blood money. <laughs> you, you gave it as blood money, but now they can't take it back. And, and Judas goes out finally and hangs himself and commits suicide. That's the end of his story. And then I look at another very important person in this scenario, and his name is Peter. And Peter is one of the inner circle, not only one of the 12, but one of the, the three that are around Jesus all the time. In fact, it sounds like he is right next to Jesus when they, when they were sitting at their last supper, when Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And, and Jesus was saying to them, and if you've been with us in the study of Mark, we've talked about the, the ups and downs, the roller coaster where Jesus would do something amazing and then he would talk about he was gonna die. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead and then he was talking about he was gonna be taken by the authorities and killed and spit on. And, and it was an incredibly painful story. And, and in the middle of this time when he's celebrating this last supper with his disciples, he looks at him and he said, all of you are gonna desert me. And of course, Peter was, was still full of himself. He was still thinking that he had the strength of character to be a follower of Jesus on his own. And he said, even if everybody else fails you, I will never fail you. And I don't think Jesus said this flippantly. I think he said it with a very sad heart. He looked him right in the eye and he said, actually, tonight, in the next eight, 10, 12 hours before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you're gonna deny me not once, but three times. And uh, one of the things that we go and see when we're in Israel is there is a, there's a cathedral there on the very site where Caiaphas' house, where the trial would have been. And it's called Ingalakantu, which means the, the crowing of the rooster. And uh, it's memorializing Peter's failure. And you know, um, there, there are two groups of people when we start talking about Jesus and how he can change our lives. And and there's one group that says, I'm too bad. I don't know if God could ever save me. You don't know what I've done. And, and I think of this, this is actually on a pillar outside the church with the rooster, uh, a, a uh, statue, a, a metal piece statue of a, of a rooster. And it is memorializing one of the greatest failures ever. Somebody who loved Jesus and knew him and then 
in three different instances, said, I don't even know the man. And finally, by the third one, he starts swearing and says he brings curses on himself to emphasize that he's denied Jesus. And right then, the rooster crows. And in just a moment, we're going to talk about the end of Peter's story and how that turned out in spite of this colossal failure. And then I, I think of the <clears throat> one little additional piece as we've been going through the book of Mark is there are various stories, and I, I love how honest the Bible is. You know, in the, in the scriptures, <laughs> you don't find a bunch of plaster and plastic saints. You, you find people who fail terribly, repeatedly, and you find the love of God and how he, he intersects with that failure. But there's one little piece here, and, and I don't know if this is for sure, but this is kind of one of those little things that scholars think, that as Mark is writing this, first of all, he's closely associated with Peter. He's, he's good friends with him. And Peter allows him to tell the whole full story. In the book of Mark, you get, you get Peter's denial in exquisite detail. And then there's this one little piece, and it says, then everyone deserted him. This is everyone deserted Jesus. And a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. And many people think that perhaps this is the way in which Mark mentions himself in such a humble way. Not, not about how great a guy he is and what he's doing in writing about Jesus, but rehearsing his, his failed moment where as well as everybody else forsaking Jesus, that he ran away and, and he was not only exposed physically because he was left naked, but he's exposed in all his shame, in all his failure, in all, in all the ways in which he didn't measure up. And that really brings us to the whole point of this, is that the death of Jesus and the way it happened and, and all of the choices around it show that I am not good enough on my own. That you look back at those stories, and I don't know if you tended to do this, but when I would read Bible stories and see Peter making such stupid mistakes, somehow in my mind I would think, if I was there, I wouldn't have done that. And I think uh, the honesty of the scriptures need to, be me need to, to bring out an honesty in us, is I would have failed just as badly, if not worse. In fact, we've challenged people to put up their story on Facebook, and, and part of my story has to do with this. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home in a pastor's family and, and it was a good home and we were sheltered together and we were part of a little church community and, and my life had so many great things to it that I often looked around at the people at school and at that time, you know, the, <laughs> the rallying cry was sex, drugs, rock and roll and, and there was a lot of rebellion and reaction to the to the authorities and, and I looked around and I saw people doing alcohol and drugs and I saw people with all kinds of strange ideas and doing all kinds of strange things and, and there was a part of me that thought, you know, I'm really not that bad. And it wasn't until I went through my own time of struggling and wrestling and, and, and I think the honest truth was is that I had a facade to maintain. And, and it was a time when people were into Eastern meditation and people were into sex, drugs, rock and roll. And, and in fact, there was a, a whole emphasis as you go through school on how, according to evolution, we're nothing but animals and we really, we really just are headed to extinction. And, and there were all these voices that were shouting at me about this is the truth. And, and the truth was, is that I was held in place by a lot of peer pressure more than my internal choosing to follow Jesus and if I had let go of that, and I knew this, I, I would have gone and really sinned. I, I hadn't been old enough when I was six and really first committed my life to Jesus. You know, I, I hadn't learned to sin very well. Uh, everybody who has kids knows that we are born with a sin nature. But I had now watched and I, and I thought about, oh, I'm living this good life. But I didn't have the internal connection with Christ to make that really who I was. It was something I was putting on on the outside. And if I could really come to admit it, I, if I had had the chance, I would have done and done all of those things and worse. And I think this is an important part of our resurrection discussion is until you come to realize that the death of Jesus shows that we can't be good enough. Why? 
because the death of the Son of God, his, his coming to earth and giving up his glory and being in a human body and, and living 33 years in our messed up world and never sinning and never disobeying the Father and then giving himself to the most cruel death possible, if that's what it took to save some people, that is an extreme solution. And you don't need an extreme solution for a mild problem. Let me say it another way. If you and I can be saved and we can spend eternity with God in heaven forever by our own goodness, then what we are saying is that the cross is not necessary. Jesus died for no reason at all. It's not important. And you know, most people who think they're good enough would never say Jesus' death was a waste of time. It was a waste of a life. But God knows, whether we know it or not, that the death of Jesus shows how desperately needy we are. And there are some people who come to the story of Jesus and the story of our response and our salvation. And some of them say, I'm fine. I think I'm good enough. And they really think that they're going to make it somehow. And some people say, I'm, I'm so bad. I don't know that you could ever, God could ever forgive me. God could ever save me. And the wonderful thing is the death of Jesus shows that we are not fine and unfortunately, you can't find salvation until you know how desperately you need it. And then the second part is the good news is no matter how bad you've been, the death of Jesus is enough. And how do we know that? Well, this is the beautiful picture. And we've been talking about this idea of a bulb. And when we were in Israel and one of our guides took us to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there are these huge olive trees that are there and, and some of them are literally 2,000 years old and, and, and they could have been a, a little sprig somewhere on a, on a tree when Jesus was actually praying in that garden. And she said, you know, and this is a Jewish woman that was not a follower of Jesus, but, but she said, in some ways, I think that the Garden of Gethsemane is as important as the cross because it was here that Jesus wrestled with knowing all the suffering that was going to come and, and not only the painful physical death, but all of the sin of all of you and me and the whole world being put on him. And he said he wrestled so much that he had like sweat drops of blood coming out of his forehead. And she said, it, it's so important as, it's as important as the cross because it's here that Jesus finalized his decision. And, and his famous words are, not my will, but yours be done. It was the surrender to all that the cross would mean. And, and in some ways, Jesus was saying, I'm going to be buried. I'm going to be put in the ground. And I'm going to die so that life might happen. Why is the, the resurrection such good news? Well, because the death of Jesus shows how desperately we need it. And the life of Jesus shows that Jesus can meet every one of our needs. It's not just good news. It is great news. And, and let's go back to the text there in Mark. The women have come with the spices to put around the, the body of Jesus. They find the tomb, the tomb has been robbed. Uh, the stones rolled away. There's somebody in there. They're saying, I know you're looking for Jesus. He's not here. Look at, look at what the next part of that is as we move to verse 6 in chapter 16. Then he says, he is risen. <laughs> I wonder, I don't think anybody said he's risen indeed. Obviously, they weren't really up to speed on how this goes. They didn't know how to celebrate Easter yet. So he is not here. See the place where they laid him. And he actually shows him the, the rock shelf. And the other gospels tell us that, that the cloth that had been put on his body and even the thing that had been around his, his head and his face, it was lying there. And then it says, now here's the good news. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you into Galilee. Wait a minute. We were planning on putting spices around a dead body and saying goodbye forever. No, that dead Jesus, he's going to be ahead of you in Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Don't you remember? In fact, Jesus repeatedly told him not only about his death, but that he would three days later rise again. And trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were so afraid. In fact, as, as the rest of the gospels play out this story, you hear that the women come back and they tell the disciples and the disciples don't believe them. The irony, of course, is that the enemies of Jesus had already sealed his tomb because they listened better than the disciples did. 
And the disciples evidently hadn't got that part. And so Peter and John come running and it says John stops at the outside and Peter <laughs> barrels right into the tomb and, and goes right in there and they see Jesus is not there. And this is what we are celebrating. We are celebrating Easter because he is not here. He is risen. You see, the one thing Satan would have had to do to absolutely kill the, the whole movement of Jesus was to allow the body of Jesus to be found. And let me tell you, I bet the Jewish authorities were looking for that every place they could because that would have nipped it in its bud because the resurrection of Jesus is what tells us that his death worked. It's like the, the death was the check that was written and when the check finally clears the bank and you see it in your account, then you know that it was accepted. You know that it worked and that the death of Jesus doesn't leave us celebrating a cross. It doesn't, we don't celebrate the gory details of his, of his death and end there. That's not the end of the story. In fact, what we celebrate on Easter is of the thousands of people that the Romans crucified, and it was a common means of, cruci- of, of punishment, that we celebrate the only failed <laughs> crucifixion that has ever been, because Jesus is alive. And he said, he's going before you into Galilee, so what does the resurrection tell us? What, it, what is it really, if we understand the meaning and the purpose of this? Well, first of all, it, it tells us how deeply we are loved. If it, take, if it took that amount of sacrifice and of pain and of suffering, and in fact, Jesus, after living a perfect life, taking all of the sin of the world on him, then it tells us the lengths to which God will go so that we can have a relationship with him. You see, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus is to be connected with our life by how we make a choice to respond to that. And if we understand that there is no greater example of love in the universe than Jesus coming and laying down his life for us because he knew that that was the only way that our sin could be paid for, that we could be connected to the Father, that we could have eternal life with him so it needs to tell us that we are loved. And, and there's another little piece in here that, that I think is so exquisitely important for us. You notice where he says, the, the young man, the angel who was in the tomb said, he is risen, he's not here. See the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Remember I told you that the end of the story is the most important part of the story. And if we had left Peter at the last part of the story, he was a miserable failure. And all of a sudden, Jesus is telling the, those who have come, he said, go tell the disciples and Peter. Because I think Peter thought he was off the team. I think he thought he had failed too badly. I think if you had said to him, Jesus loves you, he would have said, how can he? Not anymore. I, I've failed too badly. And so Jesus specifically says, even though G- Peter was part of the, the interior three, he said to him, tell the disciples and Peter. And I love this picture because the next part of our res- the resurrection story is a celebration that I am forgiven. That you and I have failed. In fact, we fail repeatedly. But Jesus said, Peter, I want to have a conversation with you. So there's a beautiful little clip as we move through the story and it's up in, in the book of John. And it says Jesus met the disciples again when they were up near the Sea of Galilee. They had gone back to their their roots. And he came back and he sits down with Peter, who I'm sure was kind of hanging his head and not wanting to look him in the eye. And he says, Peter, do you love me? (laughs) I love that. He didn't say, Peter, you know, you really messed up. He doesn't say, Peter, are you ready to try to follow again? He He doesn't try to make him feel any worse than he already feels. He says, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you, Lord. And there's more to the story, but I think the simple part is he asks him three times, do you love me? And three times Peter gets a chance for every time he denied Jesus, he gets a time to say, yes, I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. If you love me, if you follow me, then you're gonna step out of this failure and you're gonna begin to live in the power of the resurrection. And of course, the the story of Peter goes on and Peter becomes a very powerful voice and, and in fact lives the rest of his life telling people, about the resurrection of Jesus. And in fact, he, he impacts 
thousands of people by his story. And eventually he is also crucified and the end of his life then again spurs other people to be, to be grateful and to accept the life of Jesus and to understand the resurrection of Jesus. So if you and I understand the point of the resurrection, it will mean that we live loved. It will mean that we understand the power of forgiveness, that no matter what you've done, the cross is a sufficient payment for all of our guilt and all of our shame. And then the third thing, which is why it's such a celebration for you and me, is that the story of Jesus becomes our story. That if we understand what it means to surrender our life, to allow our life to be over and to be put into the ground and allow what Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done, Father, then you and I have the gift of eternal life. Now the Bible says very, very clearly that everybody who has a human spirit is going to live forever. That's not the same as having eternal life. We are eternal beings, but it's a sad thing in our culture that every funeral I do, no matter what a person's life has been like, all of a sudden people think that they have become saints and they are in a better place. And in fact, there's a weird teaching there of somebody that they become angels, which is not from the scripture at all. But Jesus said the opposite. He said, actually, the broad way that everybody wants to go leads to destruction. And you see the disciples they, they abandoned Jesus because they chose their own self-interest and their own self-preservation over following Jesus. And that's, that's what many, many people do their whole life. And Jesus said the broad way leads to destruction, but there is a narrow way. And he actually says there are few that find it. There's a narrow way that comes through understanding who Jesus is and giving our lives to him and surrendering to him. And that leads to life eternal and the incredible truth is not only that we will live in heaven with Jesus forever, but also that eternal life starts the moment you trust Jesus. That, that the Bible says not only do I just change my belief system, but when I surrender my life, that something happens. That not only am I forgiven, but that the Spirit of God comes to live in me and I begin to experience the power and the life of Christ in me. And he begins to transform me and change me and, and use me to help other people come to know him. And that I get to live an eternal life while I'm here on earth. And that eternal life then just takes a short little step and I get to live in heaven forever. Not everyone does. And in fact, some people who live their whole life trying to prove that Jesus isn't real and that they don't need to be saved. They come to the end. And there's a, a powerful story by a guy named Thomas Paine. And he was part of the early American Revolution. He wrote several uh, encouraging pamphlets that, that stirred people up and, and helped them stand for the liberty that they were trying to win. He was, he was a part of that whole culture as our country was being born. But he also wrote a book called The Age of Reason in which he talked about the foolishness of believing in Jesus. In fact, he says, these are not the words of God. These are the words of a demon. And, and he absolutely denies Christ. And he lives the rest of his life. And actually, his attitude and his, his outspoken beliefs against Christ kind of alienated people around him more and more until the fact we have his last recorded words, the, the deathbed statement, and it says, I would get, give worlds if I had them, if the age of reason had never been published. Oh, Lord, help me. Christ, help me. Stay with me, someone. It is hell to be left alone. There were six people at his funeral. You see, he, he had a huge impact in his life, but it was absolutely in the direction of himself and his country instead of a following in Christ. And at the end, he finally realized he had prepared for everything but what really mattered. I also think of another deathbed and I have a friend here from Family Church and he told me of a moving experience in his life when he was able to be at, at the deathbed of his mother. And he said, you know, she loved the Lord and she knew the Lord and she was at peace. And he said, when I was right there as she was breathing her last, and if you've ever been there with somebody who's, who's almost at the edge and the, the labored breathing, and you can basically see the, the body giving out. And he said, at that moment, 
He said such a look of peace came over her and she said he, she smiled and she was gone. And he said, I have believed all my life in what the scripture said, but I have never watched it with my own eyes. And here was somebody who had transferred from eternal life here to eternal life forever and had gone to that, that peaceful place of being with Christ forever. So we come to the end of your story and we talk about the beauty that can come when we take a bulb and you bury it in the ground and it dies. And I want to ask you specifically, what is it that you believe about Easter? What is it that you believe about the resurrection? How has it transformed your life? And if you have given your life to Christ, if you've surrendered to him, then not only can your life be one of beauty, but you get to be put in this incredible community of other people who also follow and love Jesus. And in this time when we're all being separated, I think sometimes that, that sense of being together and celebrating Jesus is, is so many more people are wanting to do that, are, are aware of how much we need that. And so I'd like to give you a challenge. Whatever your background has been, whether you've been one of those I'm pretty good people or whether you've been one of those people that says, I don't know if you can believe what terrible things I've seen and said and done. And my challenge for you this Easter is that this might be a time that you surrender. And I'm gonna pray in just a moment. And if God has been just tapping on your heart as we've been walking through this, then I wanna give you a resource, first of all. This is a little booklet. And if you would like to email us, uh, info at familychurchweb.com. This is a book called How Good Is Good Enough? And it was written by Anne Lee Stanley. And he just kind of walks through that, that feeling and that understanding of that I can't possibly be good enough. And that in actuality, that's good news when you finally understand that because Jesus said, <laughs> when you understand you're not good enough, that's when I can do something for you. And so I want to, to bring you to that place of saying, Jesus, I'm willing to surrender. I'm willing to give up my life, my plans, my expectations, my sin, my shame, my guilt. And I'm willing to commit my life to you to become a follower, not just a fan, not just a believer in who, that you did exist, but to believe that I need to follow you with all of my life. And I can guarantee you that it will be the best decision you've ever made. And that as a result, the end of your life will be incredibly different. So let me pray with us together. And if you are a follower of Jesus, let me encourage you to celebrate when you surrender your life to Jesus. And if you're not, then maybe you would just like to pray along with me wherever you are and say, Jesus, I'm ready for you to come into my life. Father, thank you for the story. Thank you for reliving the slavery that we have been in, in our own sinfulness, in our own rebellion against you, in our own self-preservation. And the picture of the cross that shows how desperately we need to be saved and the picture of the resurrection that shows how possible it is. And Father, if there are those who are listening that have never made that commitment, I pray that right now in the quietness of this moment, they would say, Jesus, I agree that I'm a sinner. I believe that you are the only solution. I want to find that narrow way. I want to have eternal life. I am willing to lay my life down and give myself to you, Father, so that you can give me your life. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here. And you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.